Section 23 of The Treasure Chest of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Candace Delick, Dallas, Texas. The Treasure Chest of My Book House. Edited by Olive Bapre Miller. The Adventures of General Tom Thumb. In November 1842, I, Phineas T. Barnum, heard of a remarkably small child, and at my request, my brother brought him to my hotel. He was not two feet high, weighed less than 16 pounds, and was the smallest child I ever saw that could walk alone. He was a perfectly formed, bright-eyed little fellow, with light hair and ruddy cheeks, and he enjoyed the best of health. He was exceedingly bashful, but after some coaxing, he was induced to talk with me, and he told me that he was the son of Sherwood E. Stratton, and that his own name was Charles E. Stratton. After seeing and talking with him, I at once determined to secure his services from his parents and to exhibit him in public. He and his mother came to New York Thanksgiving Day, 1842, and I announced him at once on my museum bills as General Tom Thumb. I took the greatest pains to educate and train my diminutive prodigy, devoting many hours to the task by day and night, and I was very successful, for he was an apt pupil, with a great deal of native talent and a keen sense of the ludicrous he speedily became a public favorite accordingly i entered into an agreement for his services for another year with the privilege of exhibiting him in europe on january eighteenth eighteen forty four i went on board the new and fine sailing ship yorkshire bound for liverpool our party included general tom thumb his parents and his tutor we were accompanied by several personal friends and the city brass band kindly volunteered to escort us to sandy hook on our arrival at liverpool quite a crowd had assembled at the dock to see tom thumb for it had been previously announced that he would arrive on the yorkshire but his mother managed to smuggle him ashore unnoticed for she carried him as if he was an infant in her arms immediately after our arrival in london the general came out at the princess's theatre and made so decided a hit that it was difficult to decide who was best pleased the spectators the manager or myself i took a furnished mansion in west end in the very centre of the most fashionable locality from this magnificent mansion i sent letters of invitation to the editors and several of the nobility to visit the general most of them called and were highly gratified the word of approval was indeed so passed around in high circles that uninvited parties drove to my door in crusted carriages and were not admitted during our first week in london the hon edward everett the american minister to whom i had letters of introduction called and was highly pleased with his diminutive though renowned countryman we dined with him the next day by invitation and his family loaded the young american with presents mr everett kindly promised to use his influence at the palace with the view of having tom thumb introduced to her majesty queen victoria i breakfasted at his house one morning in company with mr charles murray who held the office of master of the queen's household mr murray kindly offered his good offices in the case and the next day one of the queen's lifeguards a tall noble-looking fellow bedecked as became his station brought me a note conveying the queen's invitation to general tom thumb and his guardian mr barnum to appear at buckingham palace on an evening specified special instructions were the same day given me by mr murray by her majesty's command to suffer the general to appear before her as he would appear anywhere else without any training in the use of the titles of royalty as the queen desired to see him act naturally and without restraint on arriving at the palace the lord-in-waiting put me under drill as to the manner and form in which i should conduct myself in the presence of royalty i was to answer all questions by her majesty through him and in no event to speak directly to the queen in leaving the royal presence i was to back out keeping my face always towards her majesty 
and the illustrious lord kindly gave me a specimen of that sort of backward locomotion how far i profited by his instruction and example will presently appear we were conducted through a long corridor to a broad flight of marble steps which led to the queen's magnificent picture gallery where her majesty and prince albert the duchess of kent the duke of wellington and others were awaiting our arrival they were standing at the farther end of the room when the door was thrown open and the general walked in looking like a wax doll gifted with the power of locomotion surprise and pleasure were depicted on the countenances of the royal circle at beholding this remarkable specimen of humanity so much smaller than they had evidently expected to find him the general advanced with a firm step and as he came within hailing distance made a very graceful bow and exclaimed good evening ladies and gentlemen a burst of laughter followed this salutation the queen then took him by the hand led him about the gallery and asked him many questions the answers to which kept the party in an uninterrupted strain of merriment the general familiarity informed the queen that her picture gallery was first rate and told her he should like to see the prince of wales the queen replied that the prince had retired to rest but that he should see him on some future occasion the general then gave his songs dances and imitations and after a conversation with prince albert and all present which continued for more than an hour we were permitted to depart before describing the process and incidents of backing out i must acknowledge how sadly i broke through the counsel of the lord in waiting while prince albert and others were engaged with the general the queen was gathering information from me in regard to his history etc two or three questions were put and answered through the process indicated in my drill it was a roundabout way of doing business not at all to my liking and i suppose the lord-in-waiting was seriously shocked if not outraged when i entered directly into conversation with her majesty she however seemed not disposed to check my boldness for she immediately spoke directly to me in obtaining the information which she sought i felt entirely at ease in her presence and could not avoid contrasting her sensible and amiable manners with the stiffness and formality of upstart gentility at home or abroad the queen was modestly attired in plain black and wore no ornaments indeed surrounded as she was by ladies arrayed in the highest style of magnificence their dresses sparkling with diamonds she was the last person whom a stranger would have pointed out in that circle as the queen of england the lord-in-waiting was perhaps mollified towards me when he saw me following his illustrious example in backing out from the royal presence he was accustomed to the process and therefore was able to keep somewhat ahead or rather a back of me but even i stepped rather fast for the general we had a considerable distance to travel in that long gallery before reaching the door and whenever the general found he was losing ground he turned around and ran a few steps then resumed the position of backing out then turned around and ran and so continued to alternate his methods of getting to the door until the gallery fairly rang with the merriment of the royal spectators it was really one of the richest scenes i ever saw running under the circumstances was an offence sufficiently heinous to excite the indignation of the queen's favourite poodle dog and he vented his displeasure by barking so sharply as to startle the general from his propriety he however recovered immediately and with his little cane commenced an attack on the poodle and a funny fight ensued which renewed and increased the merriment of the royal party this was near the door of exit we had scarcely passed into the ante-room when one of the queen's attendants came to us with the expressed hope of her majesty that the general had sustained no damage to which the lord-in-waiting playfully added that in case of injury to so renowned a personage he should fear a declaration of war by the united states on our second visit to the queen we were received in what is called the yellow drawing-room a magnificent apartment surpassing in splendor and gorgeousness anything of the kind i had ever seen it was hung with drapery of rich yellow satin damask the couches sofas and chairs being covered with the same material the vases urns and ornaments were all of modern patterns and the most exquisite workmanship the room was panelled in gold and the heavy cornices beautifully carved and gilt 
the tables pianos etc were mounted with gold inlaid with pearl of various hues and of the most elegant designs we were ushered into this gorgeous drawing-room before the queen and royal circle had left the dining-room and as they approached the general bowed respectfully the queen smilingly took him by the hand and said she hoped he was very well general continued the queen this is the prince of wales how are you prince said the general shaking him by the hand and then standing beside the prince he remarked the prince is taller than i am but i feel as big as anybody upon which he strutted up and down the room as proud as a peacock amid shouts of laughter from all present the queen then introduced the princess royal and the general immediately led her to his elegant little sofa which we took with us and with much politeness sat himself down beside her then rising from his seat he went through his various performances and the queen handed him an elegant and costly souvenir which had been expressly made for him by her order for which he told her he was very much obliged and he would keep it as long as he lived on our third visit to buckingham palace leopold king of the belgians was also present he was highly pleased and asked a multitude of questions queen victoria desired the general to sing a song and asked him what song he preferred to sing yankee doodle was the prompt reply this answer was as unexpected to me as it was to the royal party when the merriment it occasioned had somewhat subsided the queen good-humouredly remarked that is a very pretty song general sing it if you please the general complied and soon afterward we retired the british public was now fairly excited not to have seen general tom thumb was decidedly unfashionable and from march twentieth to july twentieth the levees of the little general at egyptian hall were continually crowded at the fashionable hour sixty carriages of the nobility have been counted at one time standing in front of our exhibition rooms in piccadilly pictures of the little general were published in all the pictorial papers of the time polkas and quadrilles were named after him and songs were sung in his praise the queen dowager adelaide requested the general's attendance at marble house one afternoon he went in his court dress consisting of a richly embroidered brown silk velvet coat and short breeches white satin vest with fancy colored embroidery white silk stockings and pumps wig bag wig cocked hat and a dress sword why general said the queen dowager i think you look very smart to-day i guess i do said the general a large party of the nobility was present the old duke of cambridge offered the little general a pinch of snuff which he declined the general sang his songs performed his dances and cracked his jokes to the great amusement and delight of the distinguished circle of visitors dear little general said the kind-hearted queen taking him upon her lap i see you have no watch will you permit me to present you with a watch and chain i would like them very much replied the general his eyes glistening i will have them made expressly for you responded the queen dowager and at the same moment she called a friend and desired him to see that the proper order was executed a few weeks thereafter we were called again to marlborough house a number of the children of the nobility were present as well as some of their parents after passing a few compliments with the general queen adelaide presented him with a beautiful little gold watch placing the chain around his neck with her own hands this elegant little watch was not only duly heralded but was also placed upon a pedestal in the hall of exhibition together with the presents from queen victoria and covered with a glass vase to these were soon added an elegant gold snuff box mounted with turquoise presented by his grace the duke of devonshire and many other costly gifts of the nobility and gentry the duke of wellington called frequently to see the little general at his levees that same duke of wellington who defeated the emperor napoleon in the battle of waterloo the first time he called the general was personating napoleon marching up and down the platform and apparently taking snuff in deep meditation he was dressed in the well-known uniform of the emperor i introduced him to the iron duke who inquired the subject of his meditations i was thinking of the loss of the battle of waterloo was the little general's immediate reply this display of wit was chronicled throughout the country scarcely a nobleman in england failed to see general tom thumb at his own house at the house of a friend or at the public levees in egyptian hall 
our visit in london and tour through the provinces were enormously successful and after a brilliant season in great britain i made preparations to take the general to paris on the very day after my arrival i received a special command to appear before king louis philippe at the tuileries on the following sunday evening at the appointed hour the general and i arrayed in the conventional court costume were ushered into a grand saloon of the palace where we were introduced to the king the queen princess adelaide the duchess de orleans her son the count de paris and a dozen or more distinguished persons general tom thumb went through his various performances to the manifest pleasure of all who were present and at the close the king presented to him a large emerald brooch set with diamonds king louis philippe was so condescending and courteous that i felt quite at home in the royal presence and ventured upon a bit of diplomacy the long champ celebration was coming a day now conspicuous for the display of court and fashionable equipages in the champs elysees and the bois de boulogne and as the king was familiarly conversing with me i ventured to say that i had hurried over to paris to take part in the long champs display and i asked him if the general's carriage could not be permitted to appear in the avenue reserved for the court and the diplomatic corps representing that the general's small but elegant establishment with its tiny ponies and little coachmen and footmen would be in danger of damage in the general throng unless the privilege i asked was accorded the king smilingly turned to one of the officers of his household and after conversing with him for a few moments he said to me call on the prefect of police to-morrow afternoon and you will find a permit ready for you longchamp's day arrived and among the many splendid equipages on the grand avenue none attracted more attention than the superb little carriage with four ponies and liveried and powdered coachmen and footmen belonging to the general it stood out conspicuous in the line of carriages containing the ambassadors to the court of france thousands upon thousands rent the air with cheers for general tom paus thus before i opened the exhibition all paris knew that general tom thumb was in the city the elite of the city came to the exhibitions the season was more than a success it was a triumph it seemed too as if the whole city was advertising me the papers were profuse in their praises of the general and his performances figaro the punch of paris gave a picture of an immense mastiff running away with the general's carriage and horses in his mouth statuettes of general tom pouse appeared in all the windows in plaster marble sugar and chocolate a fine cafe on one of the boulevards took the name of tom pouse and displayed over the door a life-size statue of the general we were commanded to appear twice more at the tuileries and we were also invited to the palace on the king's birthday to witness the display of fireworks in honor of the anniversary our fourth and last visit to the royal family was by special invitation at st cloud we remained an hour and at parting each of the royal party gave the general a splendid present and almost smothered him with kisses after bidding them adieu we retired to another portion of the palace to make a change of the general's costume and to partake of some refreshments which had been prepared for us half an hour afterwards as we were about leaving the palace we went through a hall leading to the front door and in doing so passed the sitting-room in which the royal family was spending the evening the door was open and some of them happening to espy the general called out for him to come in and shake hands with them once more we entered the apartment and there found the ladies sitting around a square table each provided with two candles and every one of them including the queen was engaged in working at embroidery a sight which i am sorry to say i believe is seldom seen in families of the aristocracy on either side of the water from france we crossed the border into belgium brussels is paris in miniature and one of the most charming cities i ever visited we found elegant quarters and the day after our arrival by command we visited king leopold and the queen at their palace the king and queen had already seen the general in london but they wished to present him to their children and the distinguished persons whom we found assembled after a most agreeable hour we came away the general as usual receiving many fine presents the following day i opened the exhibition in a beautiful hall which on that day and on every other day while we remained there was crowded 
on the second or third day in the midst of the exhibition i suddenly missed the case containing the valuable presents which the general had received from kings queens noblemen and gentlemen and instantly gave the alarm some thief had intruded for the express purpose of stealing these jewels and in the crowd had been entirely successful in his object the police were notified and i offered two thousand francs reward for the recovery of the property a day or two afterward a man went into a jeweler's shop and offered for sale among other things a gold snuff-box mounted with turquoises and presented by the duke of devonshire to the general the jeweler seeing the general's initials on the box sharply questioned the man who became alarmed and ran out of the shop an alarm was raised and the man was caught he made a clean breast of it and in the course of a few hours the entire property was returned to the great delight of the general and myself wherever we exhibited afterwards the case of presents was always carefully watched from belgium we returned for a provincial tour through great britain we travelled by post most of the time that is i had a suitable carriage made for our party and a van which conveyed the general's carriage ponies and such other property as we needed we also used the railway lines freely leaving our carriages at any station and taking them up again when we returned i remember once making an extraordinary effort to reach a branch line station where i meant to leave my teams and take the rail for rugby i had a timetable and knew at what time exactly i could hit the train but unfortunately the axle to my carriage broke and i was an hour late in reaching the station the train had been long gone but i must be in rugby where we had advertised a performance i found the superintendent and told him i must instantly have an extra train to rugby extra train said he with surprise and a half sneer why you can't have an extra train for less than sixty pounds is that all i asked well get up your train immediately here are your sixty pounds what are sixty pounds to me when i must be in rugby in a hurry the astonished superintendent bustled about and the train was soon ready he was greatly puzzled to know what distinguished person he thought he must be dealing with some prince or at least a duke was willing to give so much money to save a few hours time and he hesitatingly asked whom he had the honor of serving general tom thumb when we were in oxford a dozen or more of the university students decided to play a joke on us as the general was a little fellow they concluded the admission fee to his entertainments should be paid in the smallest kind of money they accordingly provided themselves with farthings and as each man entered instead of handing in a shilling for his ticket he laid down forty-eight farthings the counting of which tiny coins with a crowd of ladies and gentlemen about waiting clamorously to buy their tickets was no small joke to mr stratton the general's father who was acting as ticket seller i had now spent three years with general tom thumb in great britain and on the continent the entire period had been a season of unbroken pleasure and profit thus closing a truly triumphant tour we set sail for new york arriving in february eighteen forty seven the general immediately appeared in the american museum drawing such crowds as had never been seen before it was then determined that the general and his parents should travel through the united states we proceeded to washington visiting president polk and lady at the white house thence toward the east the southern states and made a journey to havana where we were introduced to the captain general and the spanish nobility on our return it was agreed that i should go home and travel no more with the little general i had competent agents who could exhibit him and i preferred to relinquish a portion of the profits rather than remain longer from home in eighteen forty nine i had projected a great travelling museum and menagerie and as i had neither time nor inclination to manage such a concern i induced mr seth b howes to take the charge mr sherwood e stratton father of general tom thumb was also admitted to partnership we chartered the ship regatta and dispatched her to ceylon to procure either by capture or purchase twelve or more living elephants besides such other wild animals as they could secure the ship left new york in may eighteen fifty and was absent one year they arrived in new york in eighteen fifty one with ten elephants and these harnessed in pairs to a chariot paraded up broadway 
we added a caravan of wild animals and many museum curiosities and commenced operations under the patronage of general tom thumb who traveled nearly four years as one of the attractions of barnum's great asiatic caravan museum and menagerie in eighteen sixty one i was visited at the museum by a most remarkable dwarf who was a sharp intelligent little fellow perfectly formed with a deal of drollery and wit his name he told me was george washington morrison nutt as soon as i engaged him placards proclaimed the presence of commodore nutt at the museum i also procured for the commodore a pair of shetland ponies miniature coachmen and footmen in livery gold mounted harnesses and an elegant little carriage which when closed represented a gigantic english walnut commodore nutt and the giantess anna swan show how extremes occasionally met at my museum he was the smallest of men and she was the tallest of women in eighteen sixty two i heard of an extraordinary dwarf girl named lavinia warren a most intelligent and refined young lady well educated accomplished and beautiful i succeeded in making an engagement with her and purchased for her a very splendid wardrobe costly jewels and in fact everything that could add to the charms of her naturally charming little person commodore nutt was on exhibition with her and although he was several years her junior he evidently took a great fancy to her tom thumb had no business engagement at that time with me but he one day called upon me quite unexpectedly while lavinia was holding one of her levies here he now saw her for the first time he had a short interview with her after which he came directly to my private office and desired to see me alone mr barnum he said that is the most charming little lady i ever saw and i believe she was created on purpose to be my wife his visits to the museum were now very frequent and it was noticeable that the commodore though not exactly jealous yet strutted around like a bantam rooster whenever the general approached lavinia tom thumb finally returned to his home in bridgeport and privately begged that on the following saturday i would take lavinia up to my home in the same town i could do no less than accede to his proposal but when the commodore heard of the matter he immediately pricked up his ears and said mr barnum i should like to go to bridgeport tomorrow." what for i asked i want to see my little ponies i have not seen them for several months he replied i whispered in his ear you little rogue that is the pony you want to see pointing to lavinia the general met us at the depot in bridgeport on saturday morning and drove us to my house in his own carriage his coachman being tiddly dressed with a broad velvet ribbon and silver buckle placed upon his hat expressly for that purpose after resting half an hour at my home he took lavinia out to ride he stopped a few moments at his mother's house where she met his mother and saw the apartments which his father had built expressly for him and filled with the most gorgeous tiny furniture all corresponding to his own diminutive style tom thumb was with us for dinner and as nine o'clock approached i remarked that it was about time to retire but somebody would have to sit up until eleven in order to let in the commodore who was coming up on the late train the general replied i will sit up with pleasure if miss warren will remain also lavinia carelessly replied that she was used to late hours and she would wait and see the commodore so the family retired soon after the little commodore arrived he came to my room mr barnum does tom thumb board here asked the little bantam in a petulant tone of voice no said i tom thumb does not board here i invited him to stop overnight so don't be foolish but go to bed oh it's no affair of mine i don't care anything about it replied the commodore and off he went evidently in a bad humor ten minutes afterward tom thumb came rushing into my room closing the door he caught hold of my hand in a high state of excitement and whispered we are engaged mr barnum we are engaged we are engaged and he jumped up and down in the greatest glee when the commodore heard the news he choked a little as if he was trying to swallow something then turning on his heel he said in a broken voice i hope you may be happy never mind commodore i said to him minnie warren is a better match for you 
she is a charming little creature and two years younger than you while lavinia is several years older a few weeks subsequently when time had reconciled the commodore he told me that tom thumb had asked him to stand as groomsman with minnie as bridesmaid at the wedding the approaching wedding was announced it created an immense excitement lavinia's levees at the museum were crowded i had promised to give the couple a genteel and graceful wedding and i kept my word the day arrived february tenth eighteen sixty three the ceremony took place in grace church new york i know not what better i could have done had the wedding of a prince been in contemplation the church was filled by a highly select audience of ladies and gentlemen among them were governors of several of the states members of congress were present also generals of the army and many other prominent public men after this mr and mrs tom thumb started on a wedding tour taking washington in on their way where they visited president lincoln at the white house after a few months retirement they again resumed their public career and have since traveled around the world commodore nutt and minnie warren accompanying them and the union of mr and mrs tom thumb has proved in an eminent degree a happy marriage end of section twenty three recording by candace Stalick, dallas texas